Okay, good morning and a warm welcome to this class on an introduction to Python. Uh, my name is Paul and um, I'm excited to have you here with me as we go through this course in which we shall be looking at the foundation elements of the Python programming language. Now, this is a foundation course and the purpose of this course is to give you a good understanding of the core fundamental ideas that uh, you need in order for you to excel at Python programming. Um, and hopefully this introduction will not just be confined to your understanding of Python, but what you learn over the course of this course will also expose you to a lot more material that um, you can apply if you're going to move on to other programming languages. Um, so I hope you'll stay with me for the duration of this course. My, my goal is to make sure that uh, you can have a good, solid understanding of what it takes to learn and develop as a Python programmer. Now, some things might go wrong in the course of this presentation. Um, this will just be teething problems. And um, I hope you could bear with me. This video will be available on YouTube. I thought I was going to stream it live, but my guess is that um, I, I think I'll be using too much bandwidth if I am recording and using Zoom and streaming it live onto YouTube. So I'm going to upload this video. At the moment, it is um, it is um, recording uh, on my on my laptop, and then I will upload it afterwards up um, onto YouTube. Okay, so let's get started. And I have a presentation here. I'm just going to run through the slides. I'm going to give you an overview of what we are going to, what's going to happen today. So this is an introduction class, and in this class, you're going to learn just the core ideas. Um, okay, so let's get started. So this is the outline of today's material. Today we're going to understand why you should get into code, um, how you should get into code. There is a method to this madness. Um, and then we're also look, going to look at uh, about Site2Pro, about myself. Why should I be teaching you this course? Why do I think that I'm there? I'm the best person to give you an introduction to this. And then we're going to do a demo, a full demo. That's going to look at um, the whole process from the time you begin a project all the way till the time you have checked it into, your, uh, into GitHub to share it with someone else. And then we'll even do the reverse. We'll go into GitHub and we, we're, going to, we, we're going to be able to, um, well, probably as part of the exercises, you'll be able to pull it out and make some changes. So there are exercises that are available um, at 10 o'clock, bang on at 10 o'clock, you should get an email telling you um, the, the, the slides are available so you could follow through that. But then there's also going to be um, 10 programming challenges for you to work through, which I would suggest you start off with. If you want me to have a look at them, if you're on the tutored track, well, for everyone who's taking part at the beginning, I'm going to look at your your starting um, submissions, but then only tutored students are going to now get um, um, me to have a look at their code in the, uh, beyond the first week. Um, and then in addition to that, there's going to be um, 20 multiple choice questions for you to try out, which are going to uh, just uh, test your understanding of the material. Okay, so let's get started with why. Now, you know, we might assume just because it's attractive to get into programming, programming is for everyone. And that's not the case. Um, if it were the case, then, you know, everyone would become a rock star programmer or everyone would be working in programming. And it's not the case. Some people have an inclination to different things. And, but my promise to you is that if you give it your best shot and if you give you the time and the attention that's required to develop mastery. The, and if you are built for programming, then you will excel. That's my belief. 
And all you have to do is give it the time that it requires. There is no way you can excel without giving it the time. So what is really, really important is that you give it the time that is needed. Now, why should, you, should anyone get into programming? Well, there are three reasons. I'm only going to give you three reasons why I think you should get into programming. The first is that it's going to teach you how to think. Um, unlike many other activities, programming cannot be done passively. You have to actively, actively be involved in the task of writing programs. Um, there are So the, the reality is that there are many tasks in which you can take part in that task and you can watch a video, for example, and then think that I know this thing because I've watched a video, I know certain facts. But you, you really need to get into the nitty gritty of writing. When you're doing programming, you really get into the nitty gritty of understanding exactly how things work. So for example, if you had a task of writing an algorithm that was going to process uh, images that have a certain feature in the image and you have to figure out what are the characteristics of that image, you cannot do it passively. You cannot just you know, put together some piece of code or copy code from someone else and expect that it's going to work. That's not how it works. You have to think, you really have to understand how exactly does this problem um, what's the best way to parameterize this problem? What's the best way to make this problem efficient to solve? Because you can write a program that is not efficient, in which case it's not going to be helpful for your end user. So you have to think. There is no way of running away from thinking. Now, one of the beautiful things about programming is in the process of thinking, you have to figure things out. And sometimes you'll be figuring something out for the first time. And, and in the and as you get better and better, and as you put more and more time into it, you begin to realize there's a certain beauty to writing code. Now, in my book, what I think makes beautiful code is code that is simple, code that is easy to understand, and code that it's easy to make improvements upon in the future. Code that you don't have to memorize where you, what you named this variable, what you named this function. And that takes, it takes time and effort to achieve that. But that only comes with you developing over time your ability to think. Now, one of the books that I really love is a book by Linus Tovals, in which he talks about the beauty of programming and how... So I'm going to read for you an excerpt from, from this book. I have the book here. It's called Just for Fun. It's by Linus Tovals. Linus Tovals is the author of... Um, he's the one who created Linux. Uh, which is a clone of Unix, and he's the one who created Git. And in this book, he gives a beautiful illustration of why anyone should get into programming and what programming is about. There's a certain beauty to programming. There's a chapter here which is titled The Beauty of Programming. I'm going to read you this, this paragraph. When I read it, I remember the first time I read it, I think I teared up <laughs> because I was, this really captured me. I don't know really how to explain my fascination with programming, but I'll try to somebody who does it, it's the most interesting thing in the world. It's a game much more involved than chess. A game where you can make up your own rules and where the end result is whatever you can make of it. And yet to the outside, it looks like the most boring thing on earth. Part of the initial excitement in programming is easy to explain. Just the fact that when you tell the computer to do something, it will do it unerringly, forever, without a complaint. And that's interesting in itself. But blind obedience on its own, while initially fascinating, obviously does not make for a very likable companion. In fact, that part gets pretty boring fairly quickly. What makes programming so engaging is that while you can make the computer do what you want, you have to figure out how. I'm personally convinced that computer science has a lot in common with physics. Both are about how the world works at a rather fundamental level. The difference, of course, is that 
while in physics you're supposed to figure out how the world is made up, in computer science you create the world. Within the confines of the computer, you're the creator. You get to ultimately control everything that happens. If you're good enough, you can be God on a small scale. And I've probably offended roughly half the population on earth by saying so, but it's true. You get to create your own world, and the only thing that limits what you can do are the capabilities of the machine. And more and more often these days, your own abilities. I think that's a beautiful passage that captures what you can get out at the bare minimum out of programming. Just the ability to learn how to think and how to reason for yourself and how to go through the steps on how to solve a problem. The second reason why I think you should get into programming is that it is a real skill. Now, what I mean by a real skill is that it shows that you can actually do something. Now, most courses, undergraduate courses, you know, um, courses at master's level or, you know, different kind of courses that we take, they tend to focus on certification. That your goal is to end up with some certificate that proves that you know something. But the truth of the matter is, and you probably know this, or you probably are experiencing this yourself, a certificate tells absolutely nothing. It says nothing about what you know. What really matters is what you can do. And the certificate doesn't necessarily prove that. In some cases, where there's a practical skill um, and where the examiner, the examiner or the examining body has taken the time to make sure that you, are, you have actually learned something, it might prove that you do know something. But in most cases, there is no guarantee. And I really want to persuade you that what matters in this world, in this day and age, is skills. So let me give you an example. Suppose you wanted to hire a photographer. What, by what metric shall you decide which photographer to hire? I mean, there are many ways you could decide, decide how to hire. You could say, I want a photographer who has gone to the most prestigious school. Well, just because they've gone to the most prestigious school doesn't tell us anything about what they know. Well, I want, the, I want to get one who's got very strong recommendations. Okay, then that might be close. But what about, and it might be, the recommendations might be from clients who have had very specific needs. But then I want you to think about what if you could see what, this, um, what the portfolio that this, programmer, this uh, photographer has put together. Isn't that more persuading? Isn't it better if you can decide for yourself from what this photographer has done, the work that they have done before? That's the whole idea behind having a skill. And you really need to be able to develop your skills, not just to have the skills, but to be able to show that you can do them. And one of the things about programming is it's so easy with the tools that are available nowadays for you to demonstrate that you know something. So for example, even if you haven't studied formally, but you have a, a bunch of repositories for very high quality work, that can get you hired even if you have no formal training. Um, so there's a book that I came across. One of the books that I've really, really enjoyed is a book that's titled So Good They Can't Ignore You. And the whole point of the book is you need to have skill. You need to have real skills. You need to have skills that you can, you can bank on. Um, he, in the book, the author makes a point that, well, you have three options if you want to succeed in this day and age. Either you have a lot of money, you're very wealthy, in which case you start a venture capital firm and you, you go out looking for good ideas to invest in. Or you are a rock star programmer, you are exceptionally talented, like actors or you know, some of the most skilled full athletes like Michael Jordan, you can see in the background. Or the other option is you just have good skill. You have skills that are world class. And that's one of the beautiful things about um, learning programming is because as a practical skill, people can use that skill and then they can employ it in some production process. 
The last reason why I think you should get into programming is that it's fun. And if you think about it, this book that I just quoted by Lena Stovalls, where he talks about just for fun. And for him, this was just a game. It wasn't something that he was trying to make money out of. For him, it was something that he wanted to get involved in. And the more he got involved in it, um, the more he kept getting better and better at it. And it wasn't that he was trying even to get better. He just loved it. He loved what he could do at it. And if you find that it's not fun for you, then you might as well stop. Find something that is fun because you're going to excel at something that is fun. But I would try to persuade you, give it your best shot first. If you give it a half-hearted shot and then claim later on, I don't think I'm cut out for this. Well, that's really not decisive. What matters is that you give it a good shot. And, and how do you know that it's fun? Well, there's a simple metric. If you find it hard to stop, <laughs> if you have a hard time stopping, if you can keep going on and going on and going on late into the night, if you can wake up early, and if these are some of the stories you hear about tech startups in, in Silicon Valley, for example, where they work through the day and they only stop to eat or sleep or go to the loo, but they just keep on working at it because they love it, they enjoy it, and in the end, they get big rewards for it. Now, so those are the whys, three reasons why I think you should get into programming. It teaches you how to think, it develops a real skill, and it's fun, okay? Now, let's look at how to get into programming. Now, before we look at how to get into programming, let's look at this picture. This is a picture of Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. Now, for this building to stand firm and secure, for this building to be certified as being worth people being able to work in the building and get in and amuse themselves in the building. This building has one very special feature that is invisible. Nobody sees it. All we see is the top of the building that stretches into the sky. But the part that we don't see is the foundation. The foundation is hidden from our view. So think about the foundation of this building. How deep do you think the foundation is of this building? Well. The, the foundation extends all the way to the bedrock. As long as they haven't hit bedrock, they have to keep digging. Now, in particular, the Burj Khalifa has got a depth, its foundation depth, it's got piles, which are concrete uh, poles, which are sunk deep down. They extend for 43 meters. Now, that's incredibly deep, and yet we can't see that. The point behind this image is that the foundation that you lay is the most important. And you need a strong foundation. And the foundation is closely related to how you learn to program. Now, there are many ways you can start programming. There are many um, options that are out there. In fact, one of the things that I'm going to mention in talking about this is that we are living in a world of excess resources. The problems that we have these days are not a problem of lack of resources. Um, but I remember way back when I started programming, when I was in my undergraduate days, I remember trying to learn Visual Basic. And one of the things that frustrated me so much was just that the fact that for you to start Visual Basic, you have to have a license to run the Visual Basic runtime on your machine. I mean, think about it. These days, there are just so many options. So we live in a day and age where the problem that we have is a problem of resources, of, of overabundance of resources, not a lack of resources. And that overabundance of resources affects how we approach, um, how we approach um, the, learning, the learning problem. So I think there are three key ideas behind how to get into programming. Step number one is you have to pick a language. You have to pick a programming language. How many languages do you think there are out there? There are over 686 programming languages. If you check on the list of Wikipedia as of this week, 686 programming languages. How do you decide which programming language to start with? Well, the beautiful thing is the large majority of these programming languages have got certain repeated themes. There are certain constructs that are applied in all programming languages. 
that you're going to find, or in almost all programming languages, that you're going to find repeating themselves. That means that whichever language you start off with, you'll be learning a huge subset of what is foundational. Now, those who write programming languages have got very strong incentives not to try and deviate from what an expected programming language would look like. The moment they do that, they run the risk of people avoiding their programming language. And in fact, if you look at the most popular programming languages, they tend to stick very close together in how they do things. They might be different in how they run, but they have much of the same features, and they copy one another. When one programming language introduces a certain feature, then you'll find soon after that, the other very popular programming languages are going to follow suit uh, soon after that. And you can't go wrong with Python. Python is modern, it's versatile, and it's got communities in virtually every discipline. It's got library, a wide array of libraries. It's got excellent documentation, which is what I'm going to take you through at some point through this today's presentation. So you can't go wrong with Python. So I would strongly suggest start off with Python. It starts off very nice and gentle and very easy, and you can do very advanced things. There are things that take years to master, and, and there's no rush to get into them. What you need is a nice, solid foundation. And Python allows you to get started immediately without even knowing what libraries to import. So pick a language, and I would say pick Python. And if this is where you want to learn, you're in the right place. Second thing is you need to pick a course. Now, a lot of people make the big mistake of saying that, okay, then I'm just going to go into YouTube and I'm going to find a bunch of videos. And a lot of the videos that you'll find on YouTube are overwhelming. What they do is you'll find that they put together all the material that you can learn, what they think that is important to learning Python. So you find videos that are two hours long, three hours long, four hours. I've seen a video which is 13 hours long which has got virtually everything that you would, you know, it covers a lot of ground. Now, first of all, nobody can cover art material, all that material in one go. And even if you go through it in bits, you're going to get lost in a video. So you need certain things from a course. If you're looking for a course, if this is not the course for you, then at least take these two ideas from, from this um, video. Number one, find a course that is structured. A course that is structured is one which will take you step by step. And you don't want a course that is structured such that it gives you everything in one week or everything in, you know, in, in, in one day. There are videos that tell you, learn Python in one hour. That's impossible. That's a lie. The second thing you need is you need scope. You need a decent scope that fits in with the pace, the natural pace of learning. Now think about yourself and how you eat your meals. Is it possible to eat all the food for a week in one day? No, it's not. That's ridiculous. And even when it comes to eating and you sit down for a meal, is it possible to put all the food in your mouth at once? No, it's not. You take it in bite sizes. You take one mouthful at a time, step by step. It's the same thing with learning. In fact, some of the best science suggests that your sleeping is an important part of your learning uh, process because during your sleep, that's when you consolidate what you have learned. Therefore, you need certain number of sleeps between every learning experience. There's a reason why undergraduate courses take years. There's a reason why they're spread over a long period of time. Because you can't learn it all in one go. You're going to cram it all, you're going to have it on your fingertips for a few days, but in a month you'll have forgotten it and it won't have sunk in to your understanding for you to have a good grasp so you need to pick a course that is structured and that has a nice good scope. The way I've structured this course is it's spread out over weeks. I've included quizzes. So at the end of this course, you're going to get a 20 question quiz that's going to test what have you understood from, from all the material that you've gone through. There are programming challenges. As I said, this is a skill that you're learning. And since it's a skill, you need to be able to do practical problems and there are 10 challenges at the end of every class for you to try your hand and they just give you a practical experience they give you a hands-on feel of what it means to actually get into the code and the last thing
that is very important is you need to be accountable. Now, a lot of us live in with the illusion that you can be accountable to yourself. And however well-intentioned that is, it's a lie. You cannot be accountable to yourself. And one of the reasons for that is because we are very subjective as individuals. The more you get involved in a task, the more your focus begins to get lost. Then you begin to, you begin to drill down to very specific things, so that you lose the big perspective. And you know this. If you are writing, you have to write a, an essay or a long article, the more time you spend on one section, the more you lose the big picture. And you need a way to try and lock in the big picture. So sometimes it's better to approach it from the big picture first. Sketch out, you know, the big sections. Write out what the big sections are. And just go one layer at a time, adding one layer at a time. Until you can then now give your attention to one section and polish it. Without any fear that you're going to lose perspective. But accountability is very helpful. Especially when you're developing a skill. And you see this not just in, in learning um, environments but you see this in sports the best sports teams have coaches you need someone who remains objective who's going to keep track of your progress not get involved always have a distance and apply subtle pressure require you to meet certain goals meet certain milestones so that's one of the reasons why i want to persuade you to consider joining the tutor track because then I can keep you accountable. The other beautiful thing about having accountability is that you can learn things that are tailored to your particular situation. So if you find yourself, you're stuck or you're doing something in a certain way, your coach can tell you there's a better way. Even if you've solved it, that's great. What you've done is great, but there's a better way for you to do it. So you need accountability. You need someone to keep an eye on the progress you're making. So I would strongly invite you to consider signing up for the tutored course. So that's how you can make the best of these seven weeks. So now we've talked about why you should get into programming. We've talked about how you should get into programming. Now we are going to, um, I'm going to tell you a bit about Cytopro. Now I'll be brief here. As you know, my name is Paul. If you've watched any of the videos before, and I love programming and I love teaching. And I'm going to tell you my story in three parts. I'm going to tell you how I got into code. I'm going to tell you my first steps with Python and some of the decisions I made and how they have helped me make uh, transitions from being um, at a certain level to going to a higher level. And I'm going to tell you what my vision is behind Cytopro, what the big picture is. So. I got into code in my undergraduate study. So I studied um, electrical engineering at the University of Nairobi. I graduated in 2007, I think. It's 2007. And in, in the course of my undergraduate, we had been introduced to uh, Pascal. We started off with Pascal. And then we had a lecturer who was teaching us on, on C++. We were, we were doubling back and forth with C. And at the time, I was very fortunate because I managed to get a computer. But I wasn't really using the computer for anything serious. Most of the time, I would use it for watching movies. But then at some point, in our fourth year, we had an assignment, a lab exercise. And now, one of the things you need to know is that our labs weren't really good. Um, they weren't, for the electronic stuff, they weren't really good. It was very frustrating. But the good thing about the, this particular lab, which had programming, was that as a programming lab, I didn't need to go to the lab. The lab was in my room. I had the computer. And, and I was able to ex experience and express and learn what I could on my own. I was fortunate also to have a very good textbook on C programming. And I just tried to experiment and explore and see what I could do. And that's when the bug hit me. That's when I realized I love this. I enjoy this. Um, if I had known this, I probably would have studied computer science. Um, but then I'm glad that I managed to find this, discover this at some point in my studies. And I was able to solve that task, and I, I really enjoyed that, that, that programming problem. Then I moved on to, I got a job in a company. So I worked in a company called Safaricom. And at the time, the work that I was doing it didn't really have, it wasn't very technical. But at some point, I got an opportunity to try some technical things. We were 
working with SIM card data, and there was a lot of SIM card data in files. These files need to be processed. They needed a way to scan through the data. And I discovered Perl. And if you have gone from C to Perl, the, it's like studying you know, physics and then studying um, primary school mathematics. It's like a joke because Perl is just so easy to grasp if you've been toying around with, with C. So I really enjoyed Perl, and then I got to work with PHP, and I love that as well. Perl and PHP have very strongly resembling syntax. Um, the, the language looks very similar. Um, and I played around with SQL as well. And then um, I left that job, I moved to another company, and I started getting bored because I knew there's, there's something I want to do, but the work that I'm doing, I was employed as a technical support engineer, but it was boring. It was really, really boring. So I quit, and I enrolled at the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, and that's where I got introduced to Python. And we had a great lecturer. His name was Carl Scheffler. Um, he studied at um, he studied in, um, artificial intelligence or machine learning in the University of Cambridge. He was a great lecturer, and he taught us Python from the beginning. And then he taught us how to, and we had a lot of programming problems, and that was fun because we were solving pro probability problems using Python. We are being exposed to the different uh, libraries within Python. And then we also learned how to use a library called um, NumPy and SciPy, which are good for mathematics, statistics, engineering tasks. And, and then that's when we had, a, we had some courses on that, and then I now enrolled for the PhD. And one of the things that struck me was how I really enjoyed, I would enjoy just writing silly scripts compared to doing my work. Um, I enjoyed that so much, and I would put constraints on my work. I would say, okay, I'm going to try and solve this only using classes. Oh, I'm going to try and solve this by practicing how this library works. And just by experimenting, I got to expand my understanding of Python and its documentation. And I came to learn some key, key important ideas on how you can develop your, your skill. One of which is stick to the documentation. I'm going to take you through a tour, tour of the documentation. So that's my first steps with Python. Then I now got this job where I'm working at uh, EBI, where we work with bioinformatics. And in this job, one of the things I discovered was that in as much as I had developed good understanding of Python, the job required certain skills that you wouldn't learn as a programmer. So being able to program means you know the language, you can solve problems with the language. But then now when you have to write software, that's a different ball game altogether. And that's why the name site to pro The name site to pro is because I realized that you can have all the technical skills as a scientist, but that doesn't make you a professional in the tasks that you're carrying out. And my whole vision is that I'd love to train scientists how to write software, not just write program, programs, or no programming, but to write software. There's a big, big difference in writing software. And obviously the way to start is to build it one layer at a time. And this course is the first layer, the first foundation for you to start on that long journey to go from being having a scientific background or a background where you have technical requirements, like economists need to know statistical analysis, so this would be useful for you know, people who are in that field. But you go start by layer by layer until you have, have a good understanding of the language. Then when you're introduced to the ideas of writing software, those ideas require all these programming skills. So that's the big idea behind Scituflow. I really want to see scientists having software and professional skills. And hopefully you can even expand to other skills, not just writing software. So that's enough about me, the three, three steps of how I got into code, how I got into Python, and why I, I want to take people from programmer to software developer, because there's a big, big difference between the two. Now we're going to do a walkthrough, and in this walkthrough, we're going to start off with a blank project, and we're going to solve a problem. If, if you have come across this equation before, you, you'll, you'll realize um, this is the solution to quadratic equations. Um, so just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, 
Um, are we okay to continue? Would you like to have a, a, a short break? If you could send a message in the chat, let me know what you think. We can take a short break from here and then Okay, if you're ready to go on, then let's carry on. So we're going to work. Okay, good. We can proceed. Brilliant. So we're going to work through this. We're going to write a sh simple program, and we're going to involve everything that we have that I demonstrated as part of the getting started videos. We're going to add this to a repository. We're going to commit it. We'll push it. We'll share it, and then we we're, we're going to run it. I'll also show you how to run it because that's something that I haven't shown you before. So let's start. So I'm going to open PyCharm. So that's PyCharm. And that's uh, my project. And what we're going to do is, I'm going to first of all start by cleaning this up. Now this has a certain structure that I like, but it's got too many comments in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clean it out. I'm going to write from scratch. So it's always good practice to have a function called main. So we're going to have a function called main and for now, we are going to just let it say pass. So it's not going to do anything because there's another important part that I think you should include in all your Python modules. You're going to add a statement that says, if name is equals to main, then we're going to return the output of main. Now at the moment, the output of main, because we said pass and we didn't have a return statement, we say that the main function returns nothing. So it returns of something called none. But then it's good practice for every program to communicate to the operating system. So how do we make a program communicate to the operating system? Well, we have to include a, a library called sys. And this sys has got a number of important functions. These allow your program to communicate to the system, okay? Or it has system-related tasks. And we are going to use a function in it called exit. What ex this system exit does is it tells the operating system that program that ran, which was called main, has exited, and there'll be a number associated with the exit. So we're going to write a little comment here. So this is how you write comments. You use a pound sign or a hash sign. And you'll say that the exit, this gives exit status will be sent to the OS, the OS, the operating system. Now at the moment, it's sending none. So we have to give it something to send. By default, we usually, in Linux and Mac, I don't know about Windows, what the exit status usually is. But whenever a program terminates OK, it will send an exit status with a value of 0. So we're going to say um, 0 means OK. OK? Now, we need to get that OK from somewhere. And that's going to be from this program. So we're going to return something. We're going to return the value of OK of 0. Now, we could write 0. And that will work, and that's fine. But there's a better way to do this. The better way is to import a library called OS. And OS has got many, many functions, including some constants. And one of the constants it has is the value for OK, which will be operating system dependent. So that means if you change operating systems, if a different operating system has a different exit status, then that exit status, the correct exit status will be reported according to that operating system. So we're going to run OS. And you say X, OK. You can see that. You can't see that from the drop down. But X, OK. Um, and there we go. We have a main function that has X, OK reported to the operating system. OK? So this is, we just write a comment here. This is the return value um, of the exit status. Now, we could actually run this right now. In order for, for us to run this, let me just hide my video for one second so that you can see. We have to click on this button here. So you'll see a little arrow highlighted on the top. 
if I move my mouse out, it's on the top right, the green triangle pointing to the side. We can click that and it's going to run. And watch what's going to happen. It's going to open that and it says process finished with the exit code of zero. That exit code of zero is what we, we told it to report to the operating system. And that's how it knows that it had an exit code of zero. Okay. Now, once you run it, there's a shortcut. If you're running, um, I think this is independent of whether you run it on a Windows, a Mac, or Linux. Control R will capture the fact that you run it. And anytime you press Control R, it will run the program again. So observe, it runs it again. So that the process finished with exit code zero flashed. Now let's get back to what we were trying to solve. We are trying to solve this, this problem here. So we have this quadratic equation. The first thing we need to do is we need to get the values of A, B, and C. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hard, hard code them to begin with. And I'm going to put values of, I'll say A is equals to 1, that's a number, B is equals to 2, and C is equals to 1. And I'm going to say I want the value of X, and I'm going to hide all of this inside a function called calculate which takes A, B, and C, okay? So now that we've said that, you'll notice that on my IDE, it's underlined in red, the word calculate. And that means it, the function fun calculate doesn't exist yet. So we have to create it. And in the same way that we created a function using, uh, the main function using def, we're going to create a function here called calculate. So we're going to say def, calculate. Now here we said it takes three things, so we have to give it three things here, A, B, and C. And then we end up with a colon. And now we know it needs to return the value of x. And x, if you remember from the equation, is equals to the value of minus b. And we'll start off with a positive value, so plus. And we need now the square root. And this is where it can get tricky. There's a library within Python that has mathematical functions. And it's simply called math. So we'll just say math.square root. If we enter that, then we also need to import it. So we'll tell it import math because we need the function from the math library. And for us to, then now we need to get a b squared. So b, and this is how we write squared, two stars and a two. And then we are going to subtract four times a times c. So everything we gave it. And then we're going to return this value of x. Now, one of the beautiful things about um, PyCharm is it can clean up your code automatically. To clean up your code automatically, you might not see this because um, you'd have to click code. Does it show? No, it doesn't appear. Well, if you click code and you click reformat code, it will show you the shortcut there. And if I click reformat code, it cleans up the code and makes nice spaces. So now you notice all those squiggles have disappeared because my code has been cleaned up. So the shortcut for that is, in my case, it was um, command, I think it will be control, control, alt, and plus L to clean. I'm going to leave this here. So that cleans up your code. And again, I can run control, alt, L. It's going to clean things up. So there we are. So there's our function, and that's what it does. So let's test that it actually works. Now for us to test what it actually works, we need a way for us to see the value of x. So we're going to print out using the print function. So the print function will print out the value of x. Now we can do better than that. We can write that in a string. And Python has a special way of making a string that you can put a variable inside. It's called an f string. Um, it's f with the quotes and we'll say x is equals to, and then you put the brace sign and put the value of x inside. So that's going to now print your value of x. Okay, so now that we, we have this, let's run it again. So if we run it, it gives us a value of minus two. Now, that doesn't seem to be correct according to the values I have here. I expected to get a value of minus one, and that's because I haven't finished here. So I'm going to divide that by two times um, a. So let's run that again now, and what do we get? We get the value of, 
Let's run that again. Yeah, that seems correct. I don't know why. It's giving me two. It should be giving me two. It should be giving me one. Divide by two times a. We have a is one minus b plus the square root of b squared minus four ac. That's weird. I didn't expect it to do that. Four times a times t b. Aha. Is that, oh no, no, that's correct, that's fine. Minus the return the value of x. Value of x. Aha. Uh, b is 2, c is 1. Um, am I missing something? I don't understand why it is. Not giving me what I expected to. Oh yes, of course, of course. I need to put this in brackets, otherwise it will keep giving me the wrong value. So there we go, that's what we expected to happen. So we've divided that and we get x is equal to 1, so that's correct. But that was only one root. There are supposed to be two roots. The other root is going to be with a minus where the cursor is. So I can duplicate this line uh, you can use, I think it's control B on Windows, command B on Mac, and we'll just change that to a minus. And we have to now have this is x1, and then this is x2, and we're going to return x1 and x2. We're going to print that this is a value of x1 as x1, and we are going to say the value of x2 is equals to x2. So I'll, I'll summarize. Okay, so let's see what we've done. Now we are calculating the value of both x1 and x2. The only difference is the sign. Uh, we put brackets around, that's what the mistake we had before. And we have x1 and x2, and we're returning now both x1 and x2. Since we're returning two values, we now need to capture two values. And this is how we do it. Because we had two values here, we'll get two values here. Now the names don't matter. Whatever names are inside this function, can be anything they don't have to be tied to the names here you can change them remember this is just an overview don't feel like you have to understand everything here and um, we will go through all these things in the next weeks I just want to illustrate uh, some ideas here so now when we run this it tells us the value of x1 and the value of x2 is that okay so this is our we have solved the uh, quadratic equation now what we need to do is we now need to put this into a repository. At the moment, we are just saving it. Um, and for us to do that, if you remember, we need to go into VCS. So um, I probably need to, so we need to click VCS, we need to watch that video and we'll say create a Git repository, okay? So that's not going to show up on your screen because I'm only mirroring the Py, PyCharm app, and then you follow the steps, so you have, it'll pop up a window browser, you have to click open, and it'll now convert into a repository. We know that it's a repository because now the main here is in red. If I click away from that, you'll notice it's in red. That means it's not been added to the repository. We're now going to add it to the repository. Now, this is assuming you've already set up GitHub uh, co correctly. Um, so I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to say git and I'm going to say add. So this is not going to show up on your screen. Um, no, maybe I could actually just, let me, let me add that so that you can, you can see what that looks like. Because I want you to see everything that I'm doing. So I'm going to say display capture. You might see something strange for a few seconds. Okay, yes, I expected that to happen and now you can see everything that's on that screen. Okay, and I can hide that and see that. Okay then, so now you can see that. Let me just make sure that it is visible correctly. I'm gonna fit that to the screen. So now when I click on the, you'll see the drop downs and everything. Okay, that's brilliant. So I'm gonna add this, so I go to Git. 
I'm going to say add. When I say add, all of a sudden I change it to green. So what does green mean? Green means that it is, it is part of the repository, it's a new file, but it hasn't been added yet, okay? So we're going to now commit it because it's ready to be committed. So we're going to right click here. Well, well to commit it, we're going to come to the top right. So let me hide my video again. We come to the top right and there is this checkbox here, this tick here, and that says commit. So we'll say commit and this will pop up. I include all the files, that's fine. And then we're going to say this is our initial working version. And now we can commit it. And now it is committed to the repository. Now it's asking me to log in and it wants to know how I'm going to identify myself. I'll just give it call at site2pro.com. And I'm going to set that and commit. I'm going to uncheck this. Um, and now it's committed. So we can go back to the project window and notice that the text is white again. And if you remember from that video, if you now click the Git button, the Git tab at the bottom, we now have an initial working version shown as the only commit. Now we're going to share this on GitHub. And to do that, we'll go to GitHub. We'll say share project on GitHub. And we're going to give it a name. We're going to call it quadratic. And we could make it private if you want. You could make it public. I'm going to make it private for now. Okay. And I'm going to say share. So that should commit to GitHub. And it should make it available. So, so now that is available on GitHub. And now we are going to go through the process. I'm going to show you a few Linux commands because they're now going to move to working with the terminal. So let me put on my video again so that you can see me. And we are going to go back to the windowed mode because that's what we're going to use. So I'm going to turn this off. Sorry, I'm going to turn the display capture so that you can see only the window. Now at the bottom of your screen, uh, you should see there's a terminal. I'm going to click the terminal button. When you click on that, it's going to open a terminal. Now what on the terminal, you can do a number of things. So the terminal allows you to, to run commands. There are several commands which are essential for you to know how to use. So for example, you need to know how to change directories or how to list directories. Let's start with the listing directories first. Now to list, uh, list the content of a directory, you use the ls command. Um, the ls command will show you what's in a directory. Now in addition to the command, you can modify how the command works. You can tell it, uh, you can pass what are called flags or arguments, which modify how the command works. So for example, I think that there are more files in this folder than what we are seeing here. So we're going to say ls minus, we'll say a. When we say ls minus a, it shows us that there were actually more files in this folder because the minus a means show all files. The folder here, so there are three fold, four additional folders. And let me explain each of them in turn. The first two that you see that are highlighted there are special names uh, of folders that will be in every folder. The first one, dot, is a reference to the current directory. It means that any time you use the word dot, it will always assume you're referring to this directory. So for example, if I say ls dot, it will only show what's inside this directory. Dot dot means the parent directory. So it's the, the, the directory inside, uh, in, in which the current directory is. So let's see what's inside the parent directory, ls dot dot. Oh, there are many, many things there. Those are all the things I've been fooling around with. So ls and ls minus a. So we have modified how ls works. Another important argument you can pass to ls is the minus l for long format. So ls minus la, you can combine them that way. And when you do that, it's going to show you a lot of things. Now it's going to show you the first set of things here are called permissions, the owner, the group, and um, this is the size of the file, this is the date of the file, and this is the name of the entity, whether it is the dot, which is referring to this folder, dot dot, which is the parent folder. Now we have dot git. That is your repository. 
everything that is being tracked in this repository is stored inside this .git file. A dot file is a hidden file in Linux and Mac. And dot git represents your repository. So if you ever find a dot git folder inside a, a folder, that's a git repository. The dot idea folder is a folder that's created by Chai PyCharm to keep track of, of the project. And it has a lot of things. It has your settings, every, all the settings, your preferences that you've set for that project. Um, I like including them in repositories because it means that if I check it out later on, I just get all my preferences back. Um, and then we have the main.py file. Now let's run main.py file on the command line. To run main.py, we are going to start off with a Python 3. I would always say start with Python 3, even if you have Python 3 as the native, and main.py. And when we run that, it does exactly what we wanted it to. It gives us the values of x1 and x2. Now, another very important command is the cd command. So the cd command is for changing directories. So if you want to change into a certain directory, for example, we wanted to move, go into the .git directory, we could do that, cd.git. And now we are inside the .git directory. You can tell that because it's indicating that here, .git. Previously, we were in the quadratic directory because that was the project we were in. But now we're in the git directory. We can see what, what is inside our git repository, ls minus la. And when we run that, we see, okay, again, we have the dot. We have the dot dot. And we have some documents here. We have commit, edit, message. There's head, config, description, hooks, index, and so on and so forth. So a Git directory, a repository, is just a directory, a special directory that Git knows how to manage. Now, let's get out of this directory back into our quadratic directory. So remember the dot dot, which refers to the parent. So we're going to say cd dot dot, and we're going to go out into the parent, and now we are back inside our quadratic directory. Now, in our program here, what we've done is we have hard-coded the values of A and B and C. Let's take it one step higher and let's ask the user to give us some input. Now, the way to do that is actually quite simple. It's, we use a function called input. So let's replace all the numbers here with input. And we're going to add a prompt to it. This is what will appear on the screen telling the user what they are entering at the moment. So A colon, and we're going to do the same here. Input B colon, and then input um, C colon. Now we're going to run this again using our, so let, let's go back to, I'm going to show you the, that display screen so that you can see everything. And I'm going to now run it. So I'm going to click this, uh, let me hide my video again that you can see. So I'm going to now click on this run. So this is how we run there. If I run it, it's going to ask me, now it's asking me for A and B and C. So I'm going to give it one. And we want to see whether it will give us what we had before, two and one. And what we expect, we expect to see minus one and minus one, because those are the roots of that equation. Oh my, we have a problem. Now this is what's called a trace bar. A traceback is um, when Python shows you something went wrong and it shows you the sequence of how it found out things went, got wrong. So this traceback has got three lines which have got the same sort of pattern. So there's a file and there's a file with, a, with this. This is actually a link. You can click it. And then there's this one at the bottom. And what it's telling you is the sequence in which it was trying to run. So it said, first of all, it said, I tried to run the module, which is what you see highlighted there. When I tried to run the module, I got to this line called sys.exit, which is line 27. And in that line, I executed a function called main. So I called main, and that's where I went to next. So I was in main. I got all the way to line 18 of main, and I came across a function called calculate. And this calculate function, so I said, okay, then let me get into the calculate function. So I got into the calculate function, which is what's highlighted there. And I got to line nine and I ended up with a type error. A type error is a special error, which is telling you 
that you have tried to, you have taken something and tried to apply some operation or function on it, and it was of the wrong type. Now we'll see in next week's class that we have different kinds of types. There are numbers, there are, then there are different types of numbers, there are booleans, there are strings, and uh, those are the basic atomic types. In this case, what we have, the error gives us a bit of a description of what went wrong. It says that there's a bad operand type for unary minus operation. And what it found there was a string. It doesn't expect to find a string. Now let's trace this back. So we're going to click on this line here. So if you click on the last link here, which is line 9, calculate, I'll click on that. And what you notice is, PyCharm has taken me straight to line 9, and that's where the problem is. Now, if you look at that line, there are several places where the minus is used. But there's only one place where it's used as a unary operator. A unary operator is where it's only applied to a single number. That number is called an operand. And that's what it's telling you. So the bad operand. The operand that was applied to the minus um, was a string. And we don't want a string. Now, if we think through what we're actually trying to do here, this is a numeric calculation. And let's first of all check what is the type of B. So to do that, we are going to catch B and we are going to print the type of B. So when we print the type of B, that's going to tell us. The next time we run it, it's going to tell us what went wrong. Now, there's a natural tendency when you start programming for you to fear exceptions. And I would ask you to reverse that fear. I would ask you to love exceptions. Exceptions are the interpreter telling you that here is room for improvement. Now, naturally, we tend to think we want to write perfect code. Now, the best code is the one that has had all its errors exposed. And therefore, you really want to expose all the errors as soon as possible. So don't fear running your program and seeing exceptions. Um, don't fear that something bad will happen. It's perfectly okay. So we're going to run this again. It's going to ask us for A is 1, B is 2, and there we go. Now it's telling us that B is a string. Now previously, when we gave it hard-coded values, we gave it numbers. But now it's telling us that's a string. What that means is we need to change the value that we are getting from the input function to be a number. Now, the number that we're going to use here, is, the, the function we use here is float. Float will take the number that we give in and it will turn it into what's called a floating point. And a floating point is a number with a decimal place. That's the simplest way to think about it when, in the beginning. So I'm going to change this and we're going to call it float. Now we could stop this program right here. So there's a, there's a let me open the display capture again so that you can see this. You can see my mouse. We can actually stop this. So we'll just click on that and stop it. And it will stop it and it will say there's a keyboard interrupt. That's any time you stop a program, you'll see a keyboard interrupt. So now let's run it again and see what we get. So we get A, we get 1, and B, we get 2. Oh, now it's a float. So there's hope. And we give it 1 again. Boom, and it worked. So what we've done there is we have changed um, the input type. So I'm going to just get rid of it. I'm going to now comment this line. I'll start it off with a pound sign or I'll just comment it out um, so that we don't see that again. Now that we've done that, let's run it now from the command line and see what it works. So we're going back to the terminal. So here we are now in the terminal. I'll click on the terminal and we're going to run this. So python main.py. And now the prompt appears. Now we can give it, we're now going to, I'm going to give it some fishy numbers. So I'm going to give it 2, minus 6, and minus 3. Okay, so it's solved it. Let's try another one. I'm going to give it 1, and 1, and 1. Ah, so now we have a problem. We have a new exception. Now the exception that we see is a value error. We saw a type error, now we're seeing a value error. It's saying that there's a math domain error. 
Now, this is a tricky one to figure out, but I'm going to show you. I'll cut straight to it, and I'm going to use that to make changes using Git. So remember, we had committed our changes. Notice our file has changed to blue. Blue means that we have changes that have not yet been committed. And that's because we added this float here. Um, so I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to commit the changes that showed that included the float. And for that, I'm going to use the command line. To use the command line, I'll use now the git commands. So git has got many, many commands. There are tens of commands available. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, we'll ask the status of git, git status. So it's going to give you a, this long text here where it's telling us on branch master, that's the name of the branch we are on. Your branch is up to date with the remote, which is where we pushed. Remember we shared with GitHub? So it's up to date with that. In other words, that GitHub repository that is in the remote doesn't have anything that we don't have. However, you have changes that are staged for commit. In other words, this file has been modified but these changes have not yet been added and we are going to now add them. So what we do is we're going to say, and it gives us the instructions there at the bottom. It says git add or use git commit minus a. This is an example where we have applied a flag to the git commit function, the git commit command, which modifies what commit does. So it, it commits at the same time that it's adding. But we'll just start off with git add because you need to know that git add um, and I haven't specified anything. I have to tell it what to add. I'll tell it git add main.py. And it, it was quiet. So let's check again the status. Git status. And now look, it's changed to green. It's telling you, so your, your branch is up to date. You have changes which are to be committed. And it's ready. Okay. And now we're going to commit. So we're going to say git commit. And we're going to add a message. So if we don't add a message, it's going to give us some, ask us for a message. So I'm just going to press enter. And what it does, it'll open, it'll typically open what's called VI. Now this can seem a bit intimidating. I'll take you step by step on how we're going to work through this. The first thing is we're going to type here, but at the moment we can't type. We have to start by pressing the letter I. And if, you, if we press the letter I, we'll notice it'll change at the bottom to say insert. So now we can type. And we'll say, we'll put a commit message as we did before. We'll say, um, now using input function and float uh, and float values, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'll press escape to get out of the insert mode. You notice it disappeared. And then I'm going to shift, press a semicolon. So that will give me the colon operator on the bottom left, if you see that. And I'm going to then type X, which will say, save and close. When I do that, it's going to give me this message now. Git commit. Now, now using inputs, so that's what I told it. One file changed, four insertions. If we come here again and look at Git, we now see we have two commits. Okay. Now let's go back to the terminal and try and solve this, what we had before. Remember when we ran it, and we gave it the values of one, one, and one, we ended up with a value error. And I'll put it to you that we are currently assuming that the value inside the square root is greater than zero. If it's less than zero, we are getting the square root of a negative number. We don't want that. This value in here is called the discriminant. So we are, what we're going to do is we are going to right click I'm going to use some nice features in PyCharm. We're going to right click on this and then we're going to say refactor. What refactor is, it's going to find everywhere that this um, pattern occurs of B star star two and it's going to replace it with a variable which makes it handy for us to work with. So what we'll say is we'll introduce a variable and we say replace all two occurrences. And now we have that we're going to call it discriminant, because that's what it's called, the discriminant. And it, you see it's named all those places at once, which is really nice. And what we're going to do is we're going to add an if statement to say that if the discriminant is less than zero, then return none. So if discriminant is less than zero, 
return none, none. Because we are returning two things, it expects two things on the other end. And now let's run it again. One, one, one. And now it says none. So we've managed to catch that error, that exception, by taking care of our discriminant. And again, we're going to commit, we're going to git, um, we're going to status, we have changes in main.py, and now we're going to use git commit minus a, and we're going to use a special flag called n, which is instead of opening up vi to write the commit message, we shall write the commit message right here on the command line. And we shall say, added discriminant, we need, we need quotes, added discriminant, um, um, and handle when um, less than zero. Okay, we're going to commit and that's exactly what it's done, it's committed. Now we're going to do something special. So let's go back and just verify that we have three commits. There we have three commits. Now we're going to do something special. When we shared the project, we shared it such that it was now visible on, it's now available on, on GitHub. So what? Let, let's do this. I want to open it here. Let me open... I'll open a new window here and I'll go to GitHub and I'm looking for this project that I've just pushed. So this should be one of my new repositories. So this you're looking at a lot of uh, trash here, but let's look at my repositories, your repositories. And we have quadratic, that's what I pushed. And notice we only have one commit. So we need to now, we have three commits on the other side and we need to push those commits. So we're going to come back here and there are two ways we could push. We could push like this using this, uh, sorry, let me hide my video again. We could push using this here, push, or we could push, I'm going to show you how to do it on the command line. Um, oh no, let me not show you in the command line because there's an exercise for you to try it on the command line. So I'm going to just push it from here. I'll say push. And look, it's telling me the two extra ones which are not initially there. It will tell you, it's going to push them to origin master and I click and say push. And at the bottom you'll see it's pushing and then it's telling me successfully pushed. And now when I check on my repository, I need to refresh. And when I refresh, I now have three commits and I can even go through these commits. Are they discriminant and there we go. So what, what we've done, let me just summarize what we've done. What we've done is we've solved this problem. With, um, the, let, me, let me go back to the slide so that you can see that. We've done a walkthrough where we started off with an empty project. We cleaned it up. We put some structure. We imported sys. We imported OS. We then wrote our main function. And then we wrote our calculate function. And then we had coded values. And we improved that until we now have it in the current state. We have used git, we have used the command line, we've used ls. So we've just touched on a number of really important core things, which as you use them through the course, you'll discover you just keep getting it better and better and better. So that's it for the walkthrough. Walk through and now you have a good idea of a complete walk, uh, workflow uh, writing code in Python. Come back to this video later on and just review this material later on. Now, let's go back to the slides because um, I want to now talk to you about documentation. So, the next thing that we're going to look at now is documentation. If there's anything that I have learned in all my years is that documentation is the most important part of a language. In fact, I think one of the strengths of a lot of Python tools is the fact that they are very well documented. Python is very well documented. It's got some of the best documentation. And even if you don't have an internet connection, you have the full documentation on your computer. So that's one of the beautiful things. It's the same thing with Django. What makes Django very popular? They have got some of the best documentation, not just the API documentation, but they also have documentation about tutorials, which have walkthroughs. They have got um, exposés, which show you how the details of how to do certain things. Documentation is key. Now, naturally, what we tend to do is, when we are learning programming, is we'll do a Google search. 
You say, how do we do this? That's not programming, that's hacking. That's deceiving yourself. And the best way to learn the programming language is to get married to the documentation. That's how I think about it. You need to have it very close. You need to read that documentation back and forth and have a good, good understanding of what it talks about. And with Python, the documentation is found at docs.python.org. Now I have the documentation here open and I'm going to take you through just what you need to know. So docs.python.org, it'll naturally just take you to uh, the Python 3. At the moment, we are using Python 3.9.5, so this is a 3.9.5 version. Let me just make sure that this screen this is, it doesn't seem to fit the screen correctly. Okay, there we go. Um, now, there are a lot of things in the documentation, and if you're getting started, you don't need to know everything. You need to know just... Um, there are certain key things you need to know. So you need to know about the library. Library is probably the most important. So this is what I'm highlighting here, the library reference. Once you have a good grasp of some of the core ideas of the library reference, then it's a really good thing to read the language reference. There are some parts. In fact, in the next course on classes, the language reference is going to be such an important part. Um, that's a, the, the next course after this Python level one. So the Python level two is going to be about class Class, um, class design. And there's a lot of setup information there. For now, I just want you to focus on the language reference. I'm going to click on that and we're going to get into the language reference. Now, in the language reference, um, actually, let me do this. I'm going to come to, because uh, I want I want you to see the, my, the, my pointer. Okay, beautiful. Now, the Python standard, this is called the Python standard library. It has got all the core functions that you ever need to work with Python. It's got everything, all the libraries. You have the built-in functions. When you click that, it's going to show you all the descriptions of all the functions that are available without having to import anything. We have used the print function. We have used the input function. Then we wrote our own function but there are many, many other functions. Each function has got a nice description, including the arguments that it takes. There are what are called positional arguments and keyword arguments. Anytime you see an equal sign, it means it's a positional argument. And it gives you a description of what that function does, what each of the arguments, uh, the keyword arguments are for. Um, and it's, it's very, very handy. So some of the exercises that you're going to go through will involve you reading through this documentation. Now, in addition to the built-in functions, we have built-in constants, and then there are built-in types. From next week, we'll now go in depth into building built-in types. And we look at the truth value testing, we look at Booleans, um, we look at numeric types, um, and then in later weeks, we're going to look at lists. Later weeks, we'll look at strings. Later weeks, we'll look at all of these. And we'll build each one at a time. But for now, the most important thing is the functions. But just to give you an idea of some of the things you can do. So for example, we looked at uh, sys. So the sys... The sys... Um, where is it? So I'm using... Yeah, so the sys... This is system-specific parameters and functions that's uh, available right there, and we use that. Again, it's in the same structure as the functions. You have the names of these are constants, um, and then you have functions. This is, this is a list, for example. This is a function which takes two arguments, and so on and so forth. Let's also just look at the OS package. So there are two, so there's os.path and os. So this is for operating system interfaces, and these are depending on the operating system that you're, you're working on. And there are many functions here, many, many variables. But as I said, and some of these, you're going to see them as part of the exercises. Um, there are libraries and functions for working with networking, for email, for handling HTML, for handling XML, for, uh, for right, um, multi-processing, for all manner of things. And you can't learn them all at once. It takes years to learn all of these things. 
Um, but the best place to start is the built-in functions. Just have a look at that. All the questions that you see that are part of the, um, the assessments that you, you find are all questions which they're not asking you anything out of the ordinary. Um, okay, so that's it for the documentation. Try and stick to the documentation and only as a last resort should you go to Stack Overflow or Google for answers. Given that we are a class, you can ask questions in the classroom. I can, I can answer questions. I will answer questions from anyone. You don't have to be on the tutor track. I'll, I'll answer questions just to make sure that everyone just has a good idea. For the tutored students, I'm also going to look at the code that you're going to write because there's some code that you might, you'll have to check out. And I'm going to look at every, um, at least for this class, I'll try and look at everyone who makes a submission so that they can get some feedback. So let me get back to my slides. So that's, that's it for um, the documentation and just a recap of what we've talked about through this first class. I've told you why you should get into programming. There are three reasons I gave you. It teaches you to think. Um, it's a real skill and it's fun. We said how to get into programming. So you have to pick a language. You have to pick a course which is structured and scoped and you have to be accountable. And then I've told you a bit about Site2Pro and what the vision is. The vision is for people to learn how to write software. We've done a full walkthrough where we have um, we've looked at uh, writing, solving a quadratic equation. We've used Git. We've pushed to Git. We've made changes. We've done some com command line. And then I've shown you the documentation. I've shown you about the functions. I've placed a lot of emphasis on just the library, just start in that place. There will be exercises that are going to build your knowledge from what you've picked up from this video. And I think that's it for this video. There's nothing else. I'm going to stop the recording and that's it for the video.